Live on WFLA Now, this is Hey JB. Here's JB Buno. The pursuit for justice in the Idaho student murders will have to wait a little bit longer. With the next hearing slated for June, we're live to answer the many unanswered legal questions as all signs point to trial for suspect Brian Koberger. And I'm live here with a special guest in the WFLA Now Stream Center. Welcome into the Stream Center. JB here with you live across all platforms. Let's bring in our special guest, Clearwater attorney, uh, Peter Tragos. That's not Peter. Peter is right here. <laughs> Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know uh, who stopped in today. You were in Ta- Were you in Tampa? You were just coming around. In? Ish. Yeah, you ish, were around Tampa. Ish. And uh, stopping in to provide some of his expertise as to the big questions today surrounding Brian Koberger, the lone suspect in the Idaho student murders, the savage stabbing deaths of Ethan, Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie. And we're going to break down some of the big legal questions. But before we do, we're going to say hello to our Facebook Live, YouTube Live comment section joining us. I know that a lot of Peter's uh, followers from his channel, the Lawyer You Know channel, joining us online here as well. You can file in your hashtag KJB, hey hashtag Lawyer You Know questions. But before we begin, Peter, I just want to bring you in here. What was your initial takeaway from the hearing today with things now being pushed off a bit until late June? I think the first thing we can think about is just how big this case is going to be to take six months before the preliminary hearing, waiving his right to have this hearing within 14 days is a big deal. And when you hear that they're gonna need four to five days to present the evidence that they have against him, there's a lot of evidence. And there's going to be a lot of testimony, there's gonna be cross-examination. And really, I think pushing it out six months comes down to the defense wanting to have a chance to catch up with what law enforcement and what the prosecution has prepared at this point talk to their expert witnesses, and prepare for this preliminary hearing. So everything to me just shows the gravity and just how big this case is going to be. It's going to be uh, big when it, in fact, does happen. But let's just get this initial question out of the way. The next pretrial hearing isn't until June 26th. People want to know, given, of course, what happens. That, now, that's a four- to five-day process as far as the preliminary hearing. After the preliminary hearing concludes... When can folks, when can the general public, when can people online expect there to be the actual trial itself? Will it be days after that, weeks after that, or or months after that? At the soonest, it'll be months after that. So it could be years after that. A lot of things can happen in this case, or he can just plead guilty after that, potentially. So a lot of things can happen um, in a case like this. We really don't know, but the trial is not going to be days or weeks after the preliminary hearing. It's going to be a little bit of time. Oh, yeah. And so when we talk all the time, Peter, and I've got in here in the stream center here, folks, I've got your comments loaded up here on the screen. They're starting to come in. We're going to start to animate them on screen. But we hear so often, Peter, about uh, having a speedy trial. Oh, yeah. And these victims' families, they have to be spoken for. So when we're talking about the families of the four victims, they want answers. They want there to be the pursuit of justice they have to wait now six months for the pretrial hearing. What, what what can we say for them as far as the fact that they probably want this to be sooner rather than later? Sure, and the right to a speedy trial is the defendant's right, right? I mean, in every case, the victim wants to get this done as quickly as possible, but they balance that with what's more important for them, and that's to do it right and to get a conviction if, in fact, this is the person that has cr- committed the crimes. So I think the most important thing for the victims and their families is that this is done right. This isn't a rush to judgment. This isn't a let's get it tried sooner before the prosecutors are ready, before law enforcement's ready, before the investigation is complete. They want this to be done right. They want this to be um, thoroughly investigated and appropriately investigated so they don't leave any stone unturned. They don't leave any room for a potential appeal or some issue that happens throughout the process. So I think the victims' families are probably focused mostly on this getting done right and getting this conviction if, in fact, this is the person that committed these crimes, even more than how quickly it gets done. Let's remind our audience that we're also talking about our featured report today, an expert on what the Idaho suspect, we'll get into this a little more later, but what the Idaho suspect wanted to see upon the alleged return visit to the Kings Road residence. You can click on the link in the description on this video. It's also in the pinned comment here on YouTube Live, Facebook Live. It'll take you over to WFLA.com, the WFLA app, where you can read more, read more about our featured report today. Let's go to the comment section. Use hashtag KJB, hashtag lawyer you know, and we can animate your comments on screen. And we're going to start 
with YouTube Live. Hello to our YouTube audience. Hello to Janet Johnson, hashtag KJB. He should be in chains and cuffs. Why isn't he? Also, he appears to have marks on his face that he didn't have before. Did he get beat up? This was the number, the, the second of these two questions was the number one question that we got on our morning live stream, Peter. Uh, people talking about the marks that he had really on, on the right side of his face to his jaw. Brian Enton uh, of News Nation talked to the sheriff there in Latok County, and uh, it was concluded that uh, that there was nothing, no incident that happened behind the scenes, that this was, in fact, a shaving cut. You and I were talking pre-stream about how he appeared to be clean shaven. You can maybe talk a little bit, too, about uh, what you thought of you know his appearance today, his demeanor. That is so important, of course, when it comes to your courtroom appearance there uh, as we look at Brian Koberger uh, in court, um, and actually, that was that was that was last week's. So that was his initial court hearing. Mm -hmm. You'll see some video cycle back here of his court appearance from this morning. But it was confirmed that the marks on the right side of the face those were from shaving cuts. I would imagine it's not the best razor that you have <laughs> when you're in custody. It's probably um, just your basic standard ra razor. Um, but to the question, he should be in chains and cuffs. Why isn't he? Can we speak to that as, as to why, how, how common is it for suspects to appear, um, you know, with, with shackles around the ankles and handcuffed when they're actually sitting there in court for a hearing like this? That's usually a decision made by the jail. Um, sometimes the court will get involved in that as well. I've also read reports that his feet were shackled. So I'm not actually positive that he was not shackled. Maybe his hands weren't in cuffs. I didn't look that closely at that, if I'm being honest, but I did read some reports that his feet were shackled. It all depends on the case, and I would think he would be at this point. There's no jury there, um, so I don't know why not. Um, it really just depends on the case. I want to go to this one from Christina on YouTube Live, hashtag AJB. Can someone explain what a preliminary trial is? And I want to make sure we have the verbiage here sure. right, the language here right. Uh, it's not necessary. This is not a preliminary trial. It is a preliminary hearing ahead of the trial. Correct. And the judge is the fact finder. The judge is the one that makes the decision. There are different rules that happen in a trial. Uh, certain evidence is allowed in during a preliminary hearing. That's not necessarily allowed in during a trial. Maybe some hearsay statements. And the judge can give less weight to a hearsay statement than an eyewitness statement because the judge understands the credibility and the authenticity issues that may come with a hearsay statement that a jury might not be able to decipher. Um, it is a more likely than not that Brian Koberger committed these crimes as the standard, not beyond a reasonable doubt. Mostly what happens in preliminary hearings is the prosecution puts on their evidence. They get their experts. They can call eyewitnesses. Most of the time, it's a lot of law enforcement testimony. The defense mostly will just cross-examine witnesses. They can put on evidence, but they usually don't. There's no real reason for the defense to put on evidence at this point. But they get the opportunity to cross-examine these witnesses, mm -hmm. to get their statements, and not just what the evidence is, but how the evidence is going to be presented. And they lock in some under oath testimony that if any of that changes later on, they can impeach witnesses with the testimony they gave during this preliminary hearing. And like I said, with the six month gap here, the defense is going to have experts. We've already heard reports that they've hired experts. They can talk to their experts about the state's evidence and how to best attack that evidence, what questions to ask the state's experts. And they can do all that preparation here between now and June. And that can be part of the cross examine during cross examination during this preliminary hearing, where at the end, the judge will make a decision as to whether or not there's enough evidence to continue to hold Brian Koberger and continue forward with these charges. The big question when it comes to witness testimony, Peter, is whether or not uh, DM, the surviving roommate, we will, of course, refer to her by Dylan or DM, um, whether or not she is going to testify uh, in the in the preliminary hearing. And um, and th that, of course, is and for those of you un unfamiliar, uh, she is the surviving roommate who now, according to the probable cause affidavit, uh, saw the suspect clad in black clothing with a mask uh, covering a portion of his face uh, walk right past her towards the back uh, sliding glass door on the way out in the 4 a.m. hour, uh, the morning, of course, the early morning hours that uh, that all four victims were stabbed to death at the Kings Road residence. So uh, do you expect Dylan to testify in the preliminary hearing? And, you know, as far as as far as her taking the stand, what do you expect that to, to look like and how much can she offer other than what, of course, we already know in the probable cause affidavit? 
So she doesn't have to take the stand. The state does not have to present every piece of evidence. They don't even have to call her at trial if they don't want to, right? If they right. think they can prove their case without her, they don't have to call her. And the burden is even lower here in this preliminary hearing. So if I was the prosecutor, I probably wouldn't call her. If they do call her, the defense attorney has a right to cross-examine her. If I was the defense attorney, I might not cross her the same way I would cross her at trial, maybe a little bit differently, maybe asking a few softball questions, but not going necessarily as hard into the details as you would in front of a jury at trial. Um, this is a really kind of up in the air witness and piece of evidence because I do think she could give some answers that reasonably explain a lot of the questions that people have. Why the delay? Why didn't you do anything? Things like that. Um, why didn't you shoot her a text or whatever it may be? I think there's a lot of answers she could give to give proper context to that, but you also might not want to put her through it at this point. So you would have to yeah. balance that as a prosecutor. Is it necessary? Do we need this evidence at the preliminary hearing? Should we save it to trial where we can really make the decision as to do we, I mean, we've seen victims in cases never testify, especially if there are multiple victims like the R. Kelly trial. They didn't call every victim. They called some of the victims. Uh, sometimes it's just not worth it for different reasons. Um, and if you can prevent a victim from going through that again, sometimes you do. If you have the forensics, in the probable cause affidavit, if you have the digital forensics in the probable cause affidavit, uh, is there anything else that you would need in the preliminary hearing to ensure that this goes to trial? Let me ask you this. The odds of this going to trial percentage wise, zero to 100 are what? You say going to trial. So we're taking in a lot of different uh, things that could change course, right? If we're talking about how likely is it that the judge is going to find probable cause? 99%. Okay, that, that, that's how I think the end of the preliminary hearing is going to go. We're going to continue forward in this case. Yeah. Now, whether or not he pleads to something, I mean, we've got to put a certain percentage on that. I mean, sure. there, there could be 20, 25% chance that he just ends up pleading guilty and getting some kind of a deal. Not to mention that over the course of the next six months, there could be the introduction of new evidence Absolutely. Per, that changes everything and perhaps... A co-defendant. Who knows? You know, some kind of motive, some kind of connection. Maybe his team will find somebody else that had a motive... And he doesn't, but there's just so many ways you can speculate to what could still possibly happen. Um, but I think we're definitely going to find that there's probable cause, so we're going to continue forward in the case. The state is going to win the preliminary hearing. That's how I expect this to go. And then I expect it to move towards trial, especially because he said, if we believe his public defender in Pennsylvania um, and the statement that was released publicly, he looks forward to exonerating himself. So, I mean, that sounds like someone who wants to go to trial. And so we might not hear from... DM, we might not hear from Dylan in the preliminary phase, but of course it's, I would imagine it's quite likely given that she's in the probable cause affidavit, it's quite likely that she would be called as a witness uh, in the trial itself, no? It's a really important piece of evidence. Right. I mean, to me, that identification, that eyewitness report, what he looked like, what he was doing, the bushy eyebrows, reasonably close description and matching to how Brian Koberger is built and what he looks like. So I think it's a big piece of evidence. And I think if they can discuss with her, maybe the holes in what happened or some of the potential issues that may come up with her testimony and the timeline of how she did what she did and when she did what she did, I think that I would definitely want to have her as a witness at this trial based on the evidence in the probable cause affidavit. Now, if there's a lot more evidence, if the DNA gets a lot stronger, maybe you don't need her. But in my opinion, the way they stack this evidence in the probable cause affidavit with the cell phone pings, the cars, the mapping out, the DNA evidence, the potential stalking or preparing beforehand, and then you have that eyewitness report, that is the way you have to do a circumstantially um, uh, stacked case like this is I think she does need to testify in order to get to the beyond a reasonable doubt burden. I'll mention this a few times. Give Peter a follow, of course, on his channels. He is uh, very prevalent on YouTube as the lawyer you know, but we're lucky enough to have him right here in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, not to, What's the drive from Clearwater to here? Eh, 25, 25, 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, so he's right here in our area, in our neck of the woods. The Of course, the popularity of the Tampa Bay area cannot be understated. Uh, overstated. Um, but let's go to back to some of the comments. But I, I really want to give uh, Peter a shout out. He's here with us on stream today in the stream center. Uh, but give him a follow on the Lawyer You Know channel. Uh, Holly Swift, hashtag HJB. Does him waiving his right to a speedy trial possibly mean guilty? And they want time to poke holes in the evidence. Just seems like he would uh, want to prove his innocence quickly. This is similar to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. 
Yeah, so I, he hasn't waived his right to speedy trial that I'm aware of yet. He has waived his right to have this preliminary hearing done within 14 days. Right. And in Idaho, there's kind of different ways and timelines of when you can actually waive your speedy trial or demand speedy trial. And in this case, I don't think he's done that yet. And when I watched the hearing, it's very clear he waived his right to have this preliminary hearing done in 14 days, but he did not waive his right to speedy trial. Sometimes that's done in the form of filing a notice by his attorneys, which could have been done in this case, and I didn't see it. But at this point, I don't think he's waived his right to speedy trial. Um, he has discussed with his attorneys, and they have seemingly agreed that strategically or for preparation purposes, it would be better for them to have this preliminary hearing six months from now as opposed to six days from now, which would be within 14 days. Uh, That's an interesting question. Michelle, hashtag lawyer, you know, uh, when when is Brian's in interrogation? I I'm not exactly sure if I follow. I don't think what... there is an interrogation at this yeah. point. I don't right. think there is one. Yeah. And there may never be if he uh, invokes his Fifth Amendment right and doesn't testify at trial. We may never hear from him. Interesting, interesting question. Um, let's go to Azam. Hi there, Azam. Good to, good to have you on stream with us. Um, or it might be Azam, excuse me, hashtag KJB, hashtag lawyer, you know, does waiving, does waiving this help or hurt his case? The, the, great question for an attorney like Peter. What's up, Azam? Uh, appreciate the question. Yeah, I think, it, I would say it helps his case. I think him and his attorney thought through this, looked through this, looked at the evidence, looked at the fact that the states already had months to prepare this case with law enforcement. They're way ahead. This gives the defense an opportunity to catch up talk to their expert witnesses, see what their theories of cross-examination are going to be, how they're going to poke holes. They don't expect to win this preliminary hearing, but they're going to try to gather as much information as they possibly can from it, which will benefit his case in the long run. Um, I don't think it's necessarily something that's going to turn the tables as far as you know guilt or innocence or being a guilty or not guilty verdict necessarily. I just think it's going to help with their preparation of his defense. This is a great question because this has been brought up on News Nation, some other channels as well. Kayla Griggs, hashtag AJB, do you think that they'll still unseal the search warrant on on March 1st? Uh, Ashley Banfield made um, was making a, a point on her show talking at great length about the, seal, the nature of the sealing of the search warrant um, and some of the language there that she thought was kind of peculiar. Um, as far as the search warrant and the details that could be contained within and what that could tell us, uh, what do you think about the potential there? I think it's going to get unsealed. It may even be before March. Um, frankly, I don't see a reason why they couldn't unseal it now. I don't think there's really a threat to public safety or, you know, the victim's privacy rights. I mean, it's all out there at this point, in my opinion. So I don't really see why they're just keeping that one document sealed, except that they just haven't gone through the procedure to get it unsealed. So maybe they just wait for March 1st and then it becomes unsealed and they don't have to do any more work on it. I love this question from Karen because it, you're thinking like an attorney, hashtag KJB, hashtag a lawyer, you know, how important is it uh, for the weapon to be found if they find the D if they find DNA evidence in the car and, and on the victims? Um, well, so look, I would imagine that there's still forensic work to be done processing the crime scene. Forensics can take uh, many, many months. They were still taking items out of the out of the house uh, as recently as just the last couple of weeks. Um, but let, let's let's kind of break this down. How important is it for the weapon to be found if they find the DNA evidence? If they find DNA evidence in the car and on the victims? If they find DNA evidence in the car and on the victims? That's, that's big. That's pretty massive. Oh, yeah. And then the weapon in and of itself is just less so important. Just from a legal standpoint, finding the murder weapon, how important is that right now? It's really important. I mean, it can't it can't go without saying that if you had a weapon in this case, it would be a lot um, easier to explain how the wounds were made and what the weapon was actually like. It's very strange to me that we just have this sheath that was left right there. Everything else was so careful. There's no DNA anywhere else, at least that we know of yet. Um, we have a van shoe print, which is a very strange thing to make a big deal out of when, I mean, I don't know how many college kids in Idaho are probably wearing vans right now mm -hmm. um, or including Washington State University. Um, but I definitely think the murder weapon would be important. It's not as important as in certain cases where you here, no body, no crime. That's more important to have the actual bodies. But ha not having a, a murder weapon does not make it impossible to win, especially when you have a sheath and you can line up the size of the weapon that would fit into that sheath. And then you can line up the wounds and how they were made. And does it fit with the weapon that would be in that sheath? You have a lot of other things that can kind of move you towards that direction. But if there was DNA in his car from any of the victims or on any of the victims, if there's Brian Koberger's DNA, that would be huge. I want to get to a question from Facebook Live. Let's 
pop over to Facebook Live for a quick moment. Uh, Lisa says, five months from now, it's going to be hard to find anyone to sit on a jury. Hashtags for us both. Uh, do you agree with Lisa's? I don't think the six, the five month or six month delay is going to make it more difficult to find a jury. I think it's already going to be difficult in this small jurisdiction to find a jury. There are ways around that. Do you pull jurors from other counties? Do you change the venue? We're, I'm sure we're going to see motions like that coming in the future, and we'll talk about them um, when they come. But I don't think delaying it five or six months is going to have that. It may even have a chilling effect. Maybe people will be talking about it less than if they were to just have it two weeks from now. Um, I don't really know, but I do think that that is the only reason I could ever see for a criminal defendant in Brian Koberger's situation to waive his right to a preliminary hearing, which he can do. The only reason I can see that is maybe they don't want all of this evidence presented publicly, poisoning jury pools, having everybody convict in public, because that's what's going to happen. When you only hear one-sided evidence coming from the state um, and the judge end up saying, yes, it's more likely than not that he committed these crimes, which we've covered in other cases, whether it's the OnlyFans case um, down in Miami or some other cases of Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, when you hear these preliminary hearings, the defendants sound guilty. Um, and that's kind of how they're built because the defense doesn't put on any evidence for the most part. Sometimes they cross-examine witnesses, sometimes they don't. So that's the only reason I could see him wanting to waive it, which he didn't do in this case, is presenting this much evidence with no defense is going to make people convict him even more in the court of public opinion. As far as finding a jury, I was just doing a little bit of homework here as I was listening to Peter. So Lata County, uh, the population for the county is about 40,000 people. And uh, that is in the upper third of, if you break down, if you do, according to IdahoDemographics.com, counties by population, uh, it is the 11th most populous county in the state. Uh, so there are other counties potentially, as far as tackling this issue of finding an impartial jury and making sure that you're being as fair to the process as possible, as far as moving to a different county or potentially bringing in jurors from neighboring counties or just counties, other Idaho counties altogether, there are uh, significantly more populated counties where they could try to find the most impartial uh, jury possible. I find that very interesting because jury selection comes up all the time. I'm oh, sure yeah. it comes up on my channel. I'm sure it comes up a whole lot um, on, on your channel. And it's not like well. it's not like changing the the county or bringing in people from other counties is going to mean they haven't heard about it, right? right? There's the internet. Like where where is this streaming to? Right? Is this just streaming to Tampa Bay? I don't think no, so. It is not. So you know that the age of the internet kind of changes that. But just having more qualified jurors is why they may have to kind of expand where they're pulling jurors from or potentially change the venue um, to a different county. Let's see. Um, anonymous. Anonymous with this. Hashtag KJB. Do you think that law enforcement purposely delayed Brian's arrest so that he would be at his family home, which allowed them to legally search that too? Uh, I'm, I'm, we're going to try not to delve too much in speculation, but I'm going to just, I'm going to say this. Law enforcement is going to, of course, try to act upon the ability to arrest a wanted person like Brian Koberger as soon as they can. So much can change dynamic wise with, with a suspect. Um, you could lose track of that person. Uh, that person uh, could decide to harm themselves when they have the capability legally to move in and do so safely uh, to execute a, an arrest warrant. I, I would imagine they're not going to waste much time. They're not going to delay the process for, for very much, Peter. Is that correct? No, I think what happened is they were able to get that DNA evidence um, from the trash from his parents' house, and then when that was turned around in 24 hours, they pounced. I don't think yeah. they knew where he was going. You know, if we're talking about mid to late November when they started seeing him as a suspect, I don't think they knew that a couple weeks from them he was going to be driving to Pennsylvania to go home with his family. Maybe it was a guess because that's what a lot of college kids doing or, or are doing during that time of the year. But I don't think they necessarily knew where he was going or what he was doing to be able to plan it out this way. No, because, I mean... If they were to arrest him on the road, I would. There, there has to be a process for them to be able to execute the search warrant in Monroe County, Pennsylvania, um, as well. Uh, we're talking about a case that the FBI has been involved in. I don't know the legalities of it in, in, in their entirety, but um, it is an interesting. It is an interesting question, but I, I just don't really know if if it's something that we can answer really all that well i mean all that specifically no uh let's go to um looking for some new questions that are just coming in jackie hashtag kjb if this goes to trial 
are the parents required to testify if called? Uh, now it, it depends on parent. Are we talking about the victim's parents? Are we talking about the suspect's parents? Uh, we we, oh, we yeah, don't know, but question. we can answer. But we can answer um, in in either regard here. If you're subpoenaed, you've got to show up and you've got to testify. Uh, if his parents feel like they'd be any danger of incriminating themselves, they have a Fifth Amendment right that they can invoke. Um, if you're talking about the victim's parents, you know, both sets of parents, whoever would call, would be called, they would have to have relevant evidence to testify to. You can't just do it to harass a victim's parents or even a criminal defendant's parents. They have to have something relevant that they would testify to. If one side didn't want the parents to be called, they could file a motion in limine to try to block that, and the judge would have to make a decision as to whether or not this individual has relevant evidence to testify to. But if they're subpoenaed, if they're called, and they have relevant questions to ask, then yes, they could call Brian Koberger's parents or the victim's families. Um in this type of a case. But again, we'd just kind of be guessing as to what they would testify to that would make it relevant to come out at trial. Let's see. Let's go to Nadia. Hashtag AJB. Lawyer, you know, do you think that this isn't his first murder? I still find it crazy. He murdered four four adults with, with one knife in a matter of minutes. Let's also remind our audience, innocent until proven guilty. So when it comes to comments like this, look, um, there's there's very little way for us to know about Brian Koberger's past, other than, of course, the various interviews that have been done with media outlets, talking to people who knew him best, looking a little bit at his social media history. And the experts will examine and try to take their best guess as to um, whether or not there were um, tendencies or a likelihood for there to be uh, violent behavior before this event. We're we're not really going to get into that here. But to the to the second sentence in this comment from Nadia, I, I agree. I, I still find it um, to, to go into a home into the middle of the night to stab four college students to death with a knife, whomever it was, Brian Koberger or someone else, whoever it was, whoever the suspect, whoever did this, uh, I still find it crazy too. It, it, it's not lost on us that these stories are uh, that deal with such savage violence. Um, it, still to this day, we've been talking about it for weeks and weeks and weeks, but it's still something that it's hard to wrap your mind around how somebody can do this. Peter, I mean, I I just... Oh, yeah, I I mean, mean, it's wild, and... It's not lost on us. That's why, you know, there have been a lot of discussions of was there another person, is there a co-defendant, and a lot of these facts make us ask these questions. I think some of his background are making people like Nadia ask a question like this. We really don't know, though, so it's really hard for me to talk about somebody who hasn't even been convicted of one murder or four murders in this case, you know, how many other people have they murdered? You know, that that's kind of a difficult question to dive into at this point. Can you talk about the co-defendant aspect to this? Because you were you and I were talking about a pre-stream, and I, I want, want to make sure, because I know that question is going to come up eventually. Here. Yeah, a lot of people have been asking, you know, what is this uh, request for information about a co-defendant that Brian Koberger's attorneys have filed? I haven't looked at the filing. I've heard a little bit about it. I've read some stories about it. I've seen some questions about it. Um, it seems to be a standard discovery question that you would ask in these types of cases. Do you have any information about a co-defendant? And I expect the state to say no if we're judging based on how law enforcement has answered this question, that they think it's just Brian Koberger. They've got the guy. He's the only one. Um, But the defense did ask the question. And Brian Koberger could be telling the defense, I was just the driver. There was somebody else. They could be telling the defense, it wasn't me at all. I let my friend borrow my car, borrow my cell phone, borrow my knife, whatever it may be. Um, So they could have information that we don't know and we don't have yet. So there's not a lot that we can pull from that, except that I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the day it just comes out that the state says, no, there was no co-defendants. We have no information, no evidence about any co-defendants because it is kind of a standard discovery question. It's very interesting I I, because I've been wondering about that as well, and I've received a lot of comments about that as well. Let's go to Jess's comment. Jess, hashtag AJB, hashtag lawyer, you know. Hey, guys, do you think uh, that he will want to confess? Is he uh, waiting these couple of months to decide and just confess? All right, so uh, we stay rooted in reality. As a reminder here, innocent until proven guilty. So uh, the idea of him confessing is the idea that he did it. And so let's just preface this conversation by making sure that that's out there. It's very important that we do so. But uh, six months is a long amount of time to sit in a jail cell. It's a long amount of time to, to think about uh, what has transpired in your life and brought you to this point? Um, if we're talking about somebody, we're talking about a suspect who who did the crime. Um, is there is there any thought process that that goes on as to um, 
thinking about about confessing and pleading guilty and 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 minimizing um, the opportunity for the death sentence because the look this case we haven't talked about this yet on the stream but this is a case that could go capital um, is that something that that comes up in your in your mind if you're if you're the suspect in this case while you're behind bars it could but I'll say if I'm judging off of percentages and statistics the fact that he's agreed to kick this preliminary hearing out to June doesn't make me more inclined to think he's going to he's confess. thinking about preparing his best defense. that's what I that's what I would think that's what it indicates to me yeah and um and and let's not forget you know some for you know it's very interesting to me that over the last few days um I have seen fewer comments pointing to the fact that he is a criminology uh student and and this this might be um look he he might say he might be thinking, and this is speculative, and I understand that, but he might be thinking, I, I understand a bit as to how to prepare defense. I want my best opportunity to prepare this defense, to clear my name, exonerate myself. And so uh, this is somebody who has has studied at, at multiple levels on, on criminology and criminal justice. So that could very well be a component to this as far as wanting this six-month period and, and two, wanting the opportunity to uh, to prepare a, a legal strategy that best gives him the opportunity to to clear his name i mean that that's how you would look at it from a legal standpoint no yeah absolutely okay let's go up to this question uh next um becca who is a fan of the 49ers the giants and the sharks the san jose sharks hashtag kjb hashtag a lawyer you know does it help brian's case if he does know the victims would it be a good reason to say that's why he was in the area there has been much made about the cell phone traffic the pings that located in the vicinity of the kings road residence before and then shortly after uh the the stabbing deaths of the four university of idaho students so um does it help his case if 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 he acknowledges that there was a pre-existing relationship and acquaintance with one of the of the victims or what do you think to becca's comment here? honestly i think the way a lawyer looks at situations like this and i've thought about this from kind of both sides is whether he knows the victims or doesn't know the victims could cut both ways, no matter how you look at it. So let's say he does know the victims. Then that gives the state the opportunity to create a motive and find something in their relationship. You know, the girls ignored him and that made him mad, whatever it may be. They had a boyfriend that wasn't hid that made him mad. Um, if he did know each other, if they did know each other, but like you said, it would give some kind of reason as to why he was in the area 12 yeah. times, why he was in the area around the nights and times of the murders. Um, but then if you kick it the other way and you say they don't have any connection and they don't know each other, well, now the defense will say, why would he do something like this? He had everything going for himself. He was getting for his PhD. Um, he already got his master's. He had his undergrad degree. Why would he do this? He didn't even know these people. This is not something you do to somebody that's random. You can ask law enforcement officers on the stand, are stabbings usually more personal offenses rather than shooting somebody or some other crime, as horrible as that sounds? That's the answer. The answer is yes, stabbings are usually more personal. And especially if they have, like I said, an alternate suspect or somebody else that they think could do it or somebody else the defense team finds that has a motive that does know these victims, then it could point in that direction, right? But then it can also cut against you, as we've already discussed. If you didn't know them, if you had no clue who they were, no connection to them, why was he around the house 12 times? Why was he around the house before and after the murders? Why did he turn off his phone just during the two hours that the murders took place? You know, and then he's got to answer those questions. So from this perspective, a lawyer can cut this probably both ways, depending on what the answer ends up being. Skyler Phoenix, hashtag KJB, is his PhD going to be used against him in court? Is that is that advantageous or disadvantageous to Brian Koberger, the fact that he has studied criminal justice and was pursuing his PhD in the subject? In order for the state to use this as evidence, and I would expect the state that would use it as evidence, not the defense, um, they would have to show how it's relevant to proving that he committed these crimes, not that it gives him propensity to be more likely to commit crimes like this just because he studied them. Um, because we don't want to get into the fact that just because this person was, you know, had this job or went to this school, they're more likely to commit a crime than somebody who didn't go to that school or doesn't have this job unless it actually is connected to the murder. So this is something that could come up. And again, I think it's something that could cut both ways. I usually see it as more of a negative and being painted in that light. I mean, if we look at the public and I don't know about your comments, JD, but most of mine make it seem like, oh, this 
proves that he wanted to do it. He wanted to commit the perfect murder or he wanted to try to cover it up or he was doing this as a work study for his class or as an experiment for what he was learning in his Reddit posts asking for questions about, you know, what people were thinking when they committed crimes. He wanted to know it for himself. You know, it's mostly been a negative thing um, in the public and I think the jury would probably see it as the same thing. Very interesting. Uh, we, we have another interesting question that just came in too and this one comes in. We're going to put away... Uh, this comment from YouTube Live here in the Stream Center, we're going to hit a question from Facebook Live. It comes from Rita. Hashtag AJB, does a jury or a judge determine the death penalty in Idaho? It's a good question. I don't know the answer. I that think it's a jury, but I don't know the answer. In Florida, it's the jury. It's something we can look up. Florida. Let's go over the process in Florida. Sure. Florida, it has to be unanimous. Mm -hmm. And then the jury, and then the judge has to confirm it? Or do, isn't that, isn't that so correct? So in, in Florida... The judge can go, if the jury determines death, the judge can find mitigating circumstances and say, and no, it's going to be life. But, but the judge cannot, if right. the jury comes back life, right. they cannot say, nope, we're going with the death penalty. Yeah, we'll have to do a little bit of homework here. You know, I, I'm not sure what the process looks like. The amount of jurors, again, we're, we're here in Florida, the amount of jurors, um, the necessary component for there being a unanimous agreement amongst the jurors and then of course where the judge comes into play all, all these factors um that's a very interesting question uh let's go back to youtube live and we'll stay with facebook live as well i got them both here on my screen here in the wfla now stream center the lawyer you know peter tragos follow him of course on his social media platforms give him a follow a sub a subscribe if you that's right on on youtube um uh, he of course does great debriefs q a's answering questions he's right here with us in the clearwater uh, area uh let's see Let's go to... I believe it's the same in Idaho. Just just based off quick research here on some Idaho statutes. And okay. they have to be unanimous. Has to be but unanimous. we can look into that further as yeah. the case develops. Oh, you know, this is, in, this is a really interesting question. The Bones of Autumn. Hashtag AJB. Do you think the public will lose interest a bit now that the court date is set for June? And I'll, I'll take this a step further. Is this a tactic in any way, any way whatsoever, to bring down the amount of publicity and media coverage that this case has received? Because there's no doubt that things are now going to taper off a bit. This has been, the internet, of course, has, has gravitated and been obsessed with this story, but February will roll around, Valentine's Day, March will roll around, we'll get into Easter, we'll get into spring break, we'll get into all these things. Life will happen between now and June. Is there any chance that the public will lose enough interest that it's not as big of a deal come June? I think our commenters would say, JB, you're crazy. We're going to be back here in full force in, in June, and we're going to stay with this story between now and then. But is that part of the legal equation if you're Brian Koberger and his defense to, to, to kind of let things simmer down a bit? We've already had the inverse of this question too, right? Somebody said, we wait till June. We're never going to find a, a impartial jury at that point because everybody's going to know everything. So I think it could go either way. I think it could be something that Brian Koberger's team uh, thought about again and making this decision for what they felt was best in preparing his defense. Uh, so that wouldn't surprise me. I would say, if I was going to guess, the interest is going to be less in June than it is now, but I could be wrong, and I don't know what percentage it goes down. And then again... Once it actually starts and happens, we've seen with other cases where if you just look at Depp v. Heard, the biggest case of 2022, right? Yep. I didn't see a ton of the wave of interest prior to that trial starting. So if we have this much interest this early on in this case, does it just mean it's going to be compounded by the time we see this public preliminary hearing where the state presents this evidence? It could just be, you know, tenfold what we saw in Depp v. Heard or other cases like that that had less interest in the beginning. This is something that I really focused on when I was getting my degree, uh, and my concentration was in mass communications and new technology. And, and I will tell you this, and you don't need a degree to know this, but I'm, I'm saying that this is something that I really do focus in on is um, how people follow news stories online, how people follow trials and trial coverage online. I've never seen anything quite like that be heard, and we've talked about that on previous live streams, you and I. I've never seen something like the disappearance of Gabby Petito and the manhunt for Brian Laundry. Those are two uh, events in time where I've never seen so many people across the country from all different walks of life mm -hmm. following something with such intent and purpose. Um, I will say that what I, I think the biggest component to this is the fact that it's over four to five days. Mm -hmm. If it's one day, 
It's one day. If it's just June 26th, it comes, it goes, people read the headlines, and then they're like, okay, so when's the trial begin? But the fact that it's over four to five days, people will see the headlines on day one and then remember, oh, I'm going to watch on day two or day three, day four, so on and so forth. So the fact that it's over really the course of a week it can't, it's just absolutely enormous. And two, that brings me also to this question, which I need to get answered for all of you watching wherever you're watching from, is what it's going to look like from a media standpoint. This has been on a replay for us. And I want to know, as far as these four to five days with the preliminary hearing, uh, if it's many, many, many hours, I mean, what is it, what is it going to, are we going to, are you and I going to be starting our live streams around dinner time? And because that's when the court proceedings are done for the day and that's when it's legal for us to play it back. Is that what it's going to look like? Will streaming be permitted? It sounds like no. So that's also another key question. Can you imagine how different it would have looked for Depp v. Heard if cameras weren't permitted in the courtroom? Can you imagine just how different the media would have treated the story and how the public at large would have treated the story? Camera access and live streaming access changes the dynamic of a case from a public standpoint, the public perception standpoint, tremendously, massively. I agree. I think it builds a lot more trust when anybody talks about it, whether it's mainstream media, whether it's individual YouTubers or people doing stories on TikTok or whatever it may be. If you have actual video from the courtroom, it's harder to argue with that. People can give you their opinion. They can give you their reactions. They can break it down. They can explain it. But you actually get the opportunity, the public at home, gets to watch and actually see what this ha what happens in these cases. It seems like everything is pointing towards it's not going to be live streamed, but we're going to be allowed to have cameras and audio recording there and then watch it back later, potentially. Um, so it doesn't seem like we're going to have that instant access to a live feed, but that could change. And it's really up to the judge and the interest of justice and what the judge thinks. And we've seen other Idaho cases where there was live streaming, then they pulled the live stream, then they just allowed audio recording, which they um, only allow to be played after the hearings are over. We'll see what happens, really. It's up to the to the judge in this case. Fiona is joining us. Hashtag KJB. I'm in Slovenia, and I know about this case. It's wild. At the end of this live stream, what we're going to do, Peter and I, and we're going to be answering questions. We have another 10 to 15 minutes on this live stream answering your questions. But at the end, we're going to ask where you're watching from just to prove that point, that these cases don't answer it yet. We want to. We don't want to... Uh, oversaturate the comment section and just see, you know, names of places yet. So please hold those comments for the end. Uh, we want to see the questions now over the next 10, 15 minutes, but it will go to show that these cases, these stories uh, resonate with people around the world and they really do. And um, that's the interesting part about you say, we're going to be watching during dinner time, which sure may be our dinner time, but what time is it in Slovenia and all over the world where people are watching this? And we talk Johnny Depp, oh, yeah. Australia, the UK, Russia, everywhere people were watching from everywhere so it may be the perfect time of day for them to watch you know it's, it's really interesting when stuff like this happens in this day and age um where people are literally watching around the world this comment from wild here is is hashtag kjb i thank you for bringing this up because we were talking about this uh sometimes some of our more interesting conversations happen right before we're about to go live and right afterwards when sure. we talk about some of the things uh but um the, the, the question here, hashtag AJB, uh, will his Pennsylvania lawyer be doing interviews uh, in effect? Uh, anything considering that there's, uh, I don't wait, I'm misreading Well, the fact this. that he did the interviews affect anything considering it's, the gag order. Brian Enton of News Nation had an interview with Jason Labar, mm -hmm. the chief public defender for Brian Koberger in, in Pennsylvania. And I'll just... We'll share this. Uh, we were both, you and is I were both. Is he the actual, the public defender, the is, elected public defender? He's the chief public defender from Monroe County, Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. And he was doing interviews with with Brian Enton. And I, I thought that that was, I thought that, I'm just going to share this. I thought that was a little peculiar. This is no longer a Pennsylvania case. But correct me if I'm wrong. Is that strange for the previous public defender in, in a different state, a different state jurisdiction to be doing an interview when the case has really now put that state in the rearview mirror and everything is now really focused on the state of Idaho? Yeah, it, it's a little uncomfortable, right? It's not, not something that I would do. The attorney-client privilege still lives on, even though he's not representing Brian Koberger at this point. Um, but a lot of what he said was public, and a lot of what he said explained had already been told to different law enforcement agencies or media outlets. So, you know, I don't want to go so far into some, you know, ethics analysis to say that he did something unethical or he violated attorney-client sure. privilege or anything like that. But it's definitely unusual. 
Um, it's a little strange, but it does add context and details and facts that may help us understand a little more about the case and about Brian Koberger. I mean, he did talk a lot about his demeanor, his intelligence, what he said, that he maintained his innocence. I mean, we did learn. It was a great interview by Brian Enton. Um, you know, no fault of him doing his job, reporting and getting the details. But if I'm an attorney that has just represented a client in this high profile of a case, I'm probably not going on and discussing our communications or what I learned from our interactions. There is nothing taking this case back to Pennsylvania, correct? I Absolutely. can't see how. Uh, and, and the question about the gag order, I think somebody else asked a question about yes, the gag order did, with this. Did. So theoretically, he might not be under the gag order because he's not subject to, you know, the Idaho bar That's right, yeah. or this judge. But if they still find him as an agent of the defense team, if he's still working with the defense team, if he's giving them any information, if he's answering any questions, if he's in contact with them, he could be considered an agent of the defense team. And that gag order is on the defense team as a whole. So there could be some repercussions for Brian um, Koberger's lawyers or Brian Koberger's team. They could be considered agents. So it is kind of a sticky situation and a little gray area, depending on what his involvement still is in the case. He's, he's uh, look, taxpayer, uh, you know, taxpayers pay his salary. Uh, he was answering an interview request. I, I suppose it's really not all that, that strange. I just thought that, um, you know, I was a little surprised when I saw Jason Labar's name in, in, for the interview just because, um, but you know what? It also goes to show, and I can speak to this, when you're a reporter and you got to be doing interviews and there's a gag order at play, you, you got to get creative when, you know, a, a lot of avenues will, will close to you on who you can talk to. Uh, I know I, I do <laughs> interviews for a living. And when things close on lanes A, B, and C, sometimes you have to go down to, you know, X, Y, and Z, quite literally. Uh, let's get to the next comment. Um, oh, it's on screen. The One Ninja. Hashtag AJB, hashtag lawyer, you know. Will all the evidence against the suspect come out at the preliminary hearing on June 26th? No. No. Not likely. It doesn't have to. Just enough to prove that he more likely than not committed these crimes. If they don't prove it. I, I know you said there's about a 99% chance. There's been cases where they've asked for another preliminary hearing, and sometimes they're granted that, that second that preliminary can happen. hearing. It has a happened A secondary before. preliminary hearing. It has hearing. happened before. I don't know what the rules in Idaho are, but... That has happened before. I don't expect that to happen in this case. X, Z, Jasmine, uh, hashtag HGB, do you think that they're going to find the knife before June? I, I have been on record on live stream saying that knife could be quite literally anywhere if it still, in fact, exists, if it hasn't been completely obliterated. Uh, so the chances of them finding the knife, the murder weapon, in the next six months, next six years next six, six decades. I mean, we're talking really slim. Yeah, I have no idea. I think every day that goes by, it's less likely. Yep. I, I think that that's a, a good way of putting it. Uh, Anonymous wants to know, does single source DNA mean Brian? Brian's was the only one found on the sheath. A fabrics and DNA expert did a video stating that DNA cannot be removed from leather sheaths, sheaths and multiple DNA would be found. You know, it's interesting. This is something if, you know, uh, we're, Anonymous is... Uh, I can't say that what Anonymous is stating here is complete fact, but this is the type of um, strategy that a defense attorney would take when it came to forensic evidence, trying to poke as many holes as possible in the DNA evidence because DNA evidence, people think it's concrete, it's you know open door, shut the door type of thing, but in reality, you can find ways to poke holes in, in the forensics. Right? So I heard somebody... Uh, report some, I think it was actually his uh, Pennsylvania public defender that said, you know, we consider these cell phone pings junk science. And then I heard somebody that was a prosecutor say, juries don't think it's junk science. Ah. So when it comes down to it, this DNA type of a question, my guess is you're going to have experts explain it one way that it's got to be his DNA. It couldn't be anybody else's. It's absolutely him. Another expert saying, oh, there's all these other ways I can explain it, that it might not be his or that it could have been that he high fived somebody that then touched the knife or whatever. And it's going to be up to a jury to determine who they believe um, and who they feel is more credible with that testimony. I remember the last time you were on stream with me and I asked you uh, on a scale of one to 10, how strong is the evidence? And I remember you, you gave me a 6.8. Something like that, yeah. You feel pretty good about that till, yeah, till today? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely, I would say it's average. I, I would say it's not a slam dunk, but it's not, no way they're not going to win this case or they don't have the right guy. And and I, I expect 
that the evidence that was presented in the probable cause affidavit for us to get a lot more in the preliminary hearing, I expect the evidence to be somewhere around an eight, high eights, you know, maybe from a 6.8 to an 8.8 when we go from the probable cause affidavit to the preliminary hearing. Cat at uh, AJB hey and lawyer, you know, thanks so much. Uh, do we know if he is in uh, protective custody slash housed alone? And if so, will that stay the same till June? You know, what's interesting is that this is a more prevalent question today because now people are going to ask, what is Brian Koberger's life going to look like between now and June 26th? That's, that's a long amount of time. It, it's less of a pertinent question if we're talking about this preliminary hearing occurring at the end of the month. But the fact that it's happening yeah, in June, really in, in, the, in the summer, not even the spring, the summer, uh, we're, we're talking about people who are going to want to know every detail as to what it's like for him while while in custody. So uh, I don't know if that's going to, to change. I do know, of course, that there is a tremendous amount of concentration uh, placed on making sure that he does not harm himself, that he does not get harmed by others or harm others, that he is what you would call a high-profile inmate. Yeah, I, I agree. And I also have heard people talking about how, you know, why would he want to do this? Why would he want to wait in jail when he doesn't have to? He has a, excuse me, he has a right to have this preliminary hearing to even see if there's enough evidence to keep holding him without bail. And I've heard people explain maybe he's actually safer in prison at this point. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, as far as Kate, we asked, this, we answered this earlier. What's up with the cuts on his face today? Just tuning in. That was confirmed to be shaving cuts. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know. I'm going to go back to Brian Enton's Twitter to see if he followed up on this thread. Um, because um, I, I'm, we don't know if, you know, if he was allowed to shave himself. That's a good point. Uh, you're talking about having, you know, a razor in, in your hand. Uh, and I don't see any follow-up tweets from, from him. And so whether he shaved his own face or whether or not there was a jail uh, a member of jail personnel that shaved, assisted him with that process. You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know, but having a razor in his hand is an interesting thing. Um, let's go to some other. We're going to try to get to three more comments before we wrap this up. And and also, too, uh, Peter and I are going to be doing some stuff for Instagram and TikTok here in a little bit, too. Um, we're trying to meet the demands of all platforms. You know this. Sure. Uh, people find us on different platforms, so... We're on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, on our app and on our website right now. But um, more of a focus in 2023 is Instagram and TikTok for us. And while our primarily our live streams are always going to be here on these core platforms, mm -hmm. those platforms can't be ignored. They, oh, no, they absolutely. Have, I mean, tremendous audience there. And it's actually, it's cool. Our, our handle is actually at Tragos Law, my, my last name. And it actually says Tragos Law right under my name. Um, and those are cool because you can interact more with people through the messages. You can do some shorter things, some yeah. quicker things. So I do think different platforms have different um, benefits to the people that follow and subscribe on those different platforms. So it's kind of cool to be doing different content um, for those, which we'll do after this. Sam Lee, hashtag KJB lawyer, you know, as Kaylee's dad said that Brian was close enough to use their Wi-Fi. Does that mean he has their password, which means he must know them as far as digital forensics? This is a great question. A absolutely great question because um, if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you can connect to Wi-Fi and then you're kind of semi connected You're not connected to the internet, but you're connected enough to where you can enter in uh, a username and password or a password. And, and we don't know if, if he had the password for the Wi-Fi. That tells us a whole lot, but we don't know as to whether or not that Wi-Fi hit contained the password or, or not, or if he was attempting to connect to it. Also, we don't know if it was protected, do we? I, I don't believe that uh, Mr. Gonzalez, if he if he let us know as to whether or not it was, you know, there's open Wi-Fi networks, and then there's the ones you have to connect to uh, with the password. So uh, digital forensics expert yeah. only. Yeah, really I really don't. I, I can't answer any of this question unless we kind of look through the expert testimony on this. Um, but I do know that when we talk through this stuff, there are going to be people on the jury that think they understand this maybe better than the experts. So it's going to be really interesting just as we can. And then there may be some that have no clue how to even sign into their own Wi-Fi. So they may not even understand it. That's what's so interesting about the jury system is people bring their own experiences and knowledge to a jury trial. Let's go to, let's find a couple of other comments before we, we begin to wrap this up and move over to Instagram and, and TikTok. Um, just trying to make sure that a lot of these questions we've already 
We've already answered. Let's see here. Yeah, Sean and Neil, judge planning five days for the preliminary hearing in June. But long, short, medium? Long, long. I've had preliminary hearings. You didn't hesitate. 30 long. minutes. Yeah, sometimes a day. <laughs> Most of them are done within a day. Five days. Yeah. It's a long time. Their, their trial shorter than that. Oh, yeah. Lot, most trials are shorter than that, frankly, if you look at it, especially criminal trials. But I think that's going to have a lot to do with the expert testimony surrounding the pings and stuff like that. I think that, I think they're going to make sure you can't just say like you can in a probable cause affidavit. Hey, I'm a cop. I talked to an FBI agent who does this for a living. And he said these pings mean Brian was there. That's not enough in a preliminary hearing. They're going to have to go deeper. I wouldn't be surprised if that FBI agent that actually was the expert reference in the probable cause affidavit comes and testifies. One thing I want to mention about that Wi-Fi question as well is Brian Koberger has his degree in, um, what is it? It's like cloud evidence or something. There, there's some, One of his degrees is in like gathering evidence that, I wish I could remember what it was, but it's basically some kind of cloud-based evidence research. So who the heck knows? Maybe he understands this process. Maybe he can so hack into people's... Savvy. Yeah, that's what I would think. It made me think that when I'm looking through what his degrees are. So we'll see if that context comes into play. I have a... I I like when we get to the end of live streams, what I like to do, what I like to do is try to find those very interesting thought provoking questions. Mm -hmm. um, and th this one, this one I haven't seen yet. So perhaps y you can help us answer it. BB15 hashtags for both of us. Hi, what are the chances of a polygraph test? I know that they're not admissible in court, but will he be forced to take one? As Poly polygraph, old school. I'm not a never kind of guy, but as close to 0% chance. <laughs> how to beat this stuff maybe somebody's taught him how to beat this stuff throw it out it doesn't matter it's inadmissible and if he fails the polygraph test then it's like up oh, he must have done it so i just i don't see any benefit for a criminal defendant in his situation to take a polygraph and that's why it's its impact is minimal as oh, yeah. far as modern inadmissible. day yeah. yeah it never comes in yep um the only times i've ever heard about it on the defense side is when they hire somebody to come do it and then it's even less the prosecutor doesn't care about that i got another one here you ready okay. for this one yeah. ready for this Danny, hashtag AJB, assuming he is innocent. And you have to assume that he's innocent, right? Innocent before this proven point, guilty. Proven guilty. Yeah. Would it be wise for him to testify in a trial? It's impossible to answer this without knowing what he would say, right? So, I mean, I think if, if he's credible, if he's honest, if you believe him as his lawyer when you talk to him about this, and if you feel like you can't win the case without it, then the answer is yes. If he's not credible, if you think there's too many holes in his story, if he's not even convincing you with what he's saying as his uh, attorney and you feel like in a case like this you can poke a lot of holes in the circumstantial evidence, then probably not. So it's hard to answer this question without knowing what is his story, what would he say. You know, we have other cases where we've seen an entire police interrogation, a body cam of them talking to the criminal defendant or whatever it may be. And when you hear those people tell stories, sometimes you say, that's actually plausible. I can understand that. I can kind of believe that. Let's have them tell the jury that. In other circumstances, you say... That makes no sense. Why would anybody say that? Um, a jury's not going to believe that. You're not going to be able to trick them or talk your way out of this one. So it really depends on what his story is. And whether or not he wants to be up there. Absolutely. It's his right. The chances of him being on the stand, what? Small. I honestly have no idea at this point. Yeah. If I'm just going based on most cases, it's, yeah, less than 50% for sure. Probably closer to 10%. Um, but I don't know. Hashtag KJB from I Can Prep 2. Will the friends who were there that morning be called to testify? How many witnesses? We could hear from a lot of different witnesses. I'm sure. 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 They could be called. Um, And let's get to, let's see if we can find one more here. And let's, let's, let's also pay attention to Facebook Live. Um, as I look for one more, is there anything else that you want to bring up? on this live stream as I take a moment here. Anything that we haven't talked about that you think is really important for us to mention before we wrap things up? I really just think that at this point, we are going to hear more evidence this preliminary hearing. Are we going to hear a motive? Are we going to hear a connection between uh, the suspect in the case and the victims in the case? Because that's been something that's kind of, you know, been at the back of my mind. You don't have to have it to convict, but juries really like it to convict. I think they have a lot of evidence that a jury is going to be able to hold on to when you talk about cell phone pings and video evidence of where the car is, that it's his car, where he drove it, when he drove it, his DNA at the scene, and even an eyewitness saying and describing somebody that may look like Brian Koberger. They have a lot of evidence 
in the day of CSI and all the shows that we watch that I think a jury will cling to, but they're really missing that key piece, which which is the motive in this case. So that's what I'm interested in seeing. Will we hear more about that? But at this point, we really are going to wait. I think a lot's going to happen between now and June. I think we're still going to see court filings. I think we may still see more than we expect between now and June, but it's ne definitely not going to be as quick hitting as it's been the last, you know, two months. I'm going to actually, we're going to do a few more because I called for some comments and now some good ones came in really quickly. Hannah wants to know for both of us, uh, would they even let us know if they had found the weapon slash suspects clothes uh, already? People are, who are, who are asking now that the gag order is in effect and now that the, the probable cause affidavit has been released. What in the aftermath of that probable cause affidavit being written, is there a chance that, there has been the discovery of more evidence since that point. Yes, but what I'll say is at that point, I don't think they had a murder weapon because law enforcement pretty clearly stated they did not, and I don't see how it would benefit them to not be honest about that. If they had the murder weapon, I think people would be even more inclined to think that they've got the right guy. If. Big if. A dangerous, dangerous, dangerous word here as I preface this. If they found the murder weapon this week, would we know? Not necessarily, there's although a there's a gag order. There's already been leaks, right? That's there's already saying, been leaks since the gag sources. order. I would expect we would find out through a leak, um, but it, it's possible. Final two questions. Inf in, 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 they're kind of similar. Infamous truth teller. Hashtag KJB. Will all, will all the false narratives on social media affect jury slash trial? That's something I'm sure that you could speak to for a while. And then M. Palmer. Hashtag KJB. Lawyer, you know, uh, what does the next five months look like for the public to find out what's going on? In the case, I'll answer this one first, and then we'll go back to the infamous truth teller comment. Uh, that's really that falls on us as journalists now to um, continue to cover the story as new information is presented, and really as journalists find out more information as they work their sources, um, you know, file uh, requests for documents, uh, talk to people, and making sure that they are honed in on the story. I, I will say the News Nation has done a really great job as far as staying on this story um, but really uh, a lot of that will, will come down to media coverage and, and of course that's something that we'll be uh, focused on here a lot of other cases you know uh, really I'm, I'm really super honed in on Anna Walsh right now what's going on in Massachusetts uh, there's so many other cases that we are covering this one joins uh, many many others that we're going to stay on top of but that really falls on us as far as the previous comment Peter will all the false narratives on social media affect jury slash trial that's something you could answer better than i could yeah you when you say us i mean you and and your journalist people not me i'm not a journalist <laughs> just a lawyer so yeah i mean i think the the social media narratives always are going to be important in today's day and age and i think they can really affect whether or not we're going to have cameras in the courtroom whether or not we're going to have live streams this stuff whether you believe it or not everyone in the comments everybody watching these streams you can have an effect on that we have seen it in um, court orders where judges discuss how people are talking about the defendant's facial expressions or their makeup or what they're wearing. And therefore we need to pull the cameras because in the interest of justice, we've got to make sure we have a fair trial here. So they can absolutely affect cameras in the courtroom. They can affect, they can affect what potential jurors are listening to, what potential jurors are watching. These jurors are going to be asked those questions. What have you seen? What have you heard? What have you read? Um, that may already give you a lean towards the prosecution or towards the defense in this case. So it's going to have an effect. It's going to be important, which is why we all, anybody that's talking about this case on show, social media with your friends, publicly, privately, need to make sure we keep an open mind, presume him innocent at this point, um, discuss what we think about the case, discuss what we think may happen. You can speculate a little bit, but I think it's really important for us to remember all of that and remember how this can affect somebody's constitutional rights, somebody's freedom, um, justice for victims. We need to make sure that we all as the public can affect that. So let's make sure we, we understand that as we go forward talking about this case. Really important reminder, um, given where things stand presently. And I always remind people, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, it's, it's really, it's so important given how social media uh, just can kind of run wild these days. Um, and also too, there's so much misinformation out there that's going to bring me to my very regular, our moderators I'm sure know, or frequent viewers know, I am always, always telling people to be mindful of the misinformation landmines mm -hmm. that exist on social media. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm starting to do more stuff on TikTok, to tell you the truth. Um, there was there was a lot of uh, people, um, a, lot of, a lot of TikTok social media users who, uh, over the course of some of the stories that I have covered, who would screenshot my work uh, or screenshot our, my reports and 
think that they knew how to represent that work, but then say something that wasn't entirely true. And while I know that most content creators on TikTok, they're well-intentioned, they wanna spread good information, I know that they do. Sometimes when information is, is shared online and you play the telephone game, before you know it, things get misconstrued. And so why, uh, why ignore those platforms? Not that I have been ignoring those platforms, but we have found a way here at WFLA um, to make sure that we are present on those platforms too. So Instagram Reels, uh, TikTok, uh, those platforms get so many eyeballs. Uh, w we're going to be on those platforms more and more and more. Uh, are you? Are you on? You're on Instagram. I know you're on Instagram. Yeah. Are you on TikTok? Instagram is Tragos Law. TikTok, I think, is the lawyer. You know, we have been posting some on there, but not a ton. Yeah, we're we're yeah. going to be increasing. I, I can speak for myself. Peter, being our special guest today in the Stream Center. Yeah, I can speak for myself saying that um, on TikTok, I'm going to be doing some more stuff, and I hope that folks follow us there. And we're going to start to do more unique content for that platform. I'm not just going to be taking snippets of our streams and just kind of posting it there. Mm -hmm. That will happen from time to time when we have something that we feel like we really need to get out. Um, but we're going to try to do some unique content over there to combat the spread of misinformation. My, my view of interactive journalism, we interact with you to help, you know, to point out fact from fiction and talk about the area, the gray area that exists between fact and fiction. So if we can interact with you live, it's very similar to the work that Peter does. Peter wants to help clear up some of the, some of the junk that's out there when it comes to um, the erroneous, you know, people that claim to be reporting fact. And we're, we're not sitting here all high and mighty saying that we have all the answers, but we also just wanna make sure that people are pointed in the right direction uh, rather than the wrong ones. That's, that's, really, um, that's really, really important to me. Let's, uh, let's start um, asking our audience really quickly to let us know where you're watching from. I will shout out um, some commenters. You're a lawyer, you know community. Where, where do they watch you from? You get you get a lot of people joining you. It's all over, man. I mean, it feels like shout out cities, countries, from, uh, states. Yeah, in the comment section. A lot of California, Virginia, UK for Johnny Depp for some yeah, reason. Yep, yep, yep. A lot of Florida just from the cases that are in Florida all the time. Well, with people Depp that heard, know, there yep. was the, the UK component because yep. of the trial that existed over there too. Exactly, and now we've got a lot of Wisconsin from the Waukesha Christmas parade case, that Daryl Brooks case, a lot there, um, and. Uh, Idaho now it's it seems like people from the communities end up in the chats which is really cool um, and they give some context with their comments and questions so I, I always love that it's it's always a good time people from all over I like different perspectives I like diverse backgrounds I like different questions I like different ideologies um, it makes it more interesting for the conversation some in my of my opinion. favorite questions that I have received over the course of, of this live streaming adventure that we're on here at WFLA now come from the UK yeah because there's just such a different a different perspective mm -hmm. from the UK. And so let's let's get to some commenters. Idaho mom is joining us from, guess. Uh, Florida? <laughs> Idaho. Yeah. Uh, we've got Maria, who's joining us from Berlin, Germany. Charlotte from Montreal, Canada. Lori from Fort Myers Beach right here in the sunshine state of? Florida. Yeah, you know it. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, Austin, Florida, the little, little, or littlest little, excuse me. Mo is from Maryland. Uh, Mary Beth from Minnesota. Uh, we've got, let's see, more. we're recently coming in. Missy from Colorado, Girl Friday from Southern California. All you need is love. It's a great username on YouTube. Uh, joining us from Kansas. Three more. Um, Tonya is joining us from Maryville, Tennessee. Awesome. Uh, let's go to, let's see. We've got, wow, see, we were talking about this. Uh, Kitty Martin, hashtag HAB here in Yorkshire, England. Thanks for keeping us uh, all updated. Uh, sending love and then one more wow yeah. Azam. Azam is is always she's a very uh yeah. she's always a From Malaysia in our in our chats and I think it's 12 hours different so I mean wow. when I go on at five o'clock p.m I think it's five o'clock a.m for her and she's still there she sets alarm she's awesome Peter and I say hello to you we both say hello, Azam, and hope that you're well over there uh, in Malaysia. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to hop off stream now. Uh, the very latest, of course, on our featured report, uh, the expert on what the Idaho suspect wanted to see when he returned back to the house. That's on WFLA.com, the WFLA app. Uh, what we are going to do is we're going to hop off to do some content for uh, TikTok and Instagram Reels. You can follow me on Instagram at WFLAJB. Same on TikTok at WFLAJB. Your social media accounts, Peter. At Tragos Law on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, I think. Then lawyer, you know everywhere else, TikTok, YouTube, Pinterest, maybe, I don't know. 
if you if you have Pinterest, who the heck Vine, does? MySpace. Yeah. If you um, if you join us on one of those platforms, let us know that you were watching us on stream and that you went over there. Uh, that lets us know that you guys are watching. Um, really appreciate it. I uh, hope that you join us on those various platforms. Peter, thanks so much. I want to thank you personally and professionally for uh, for coming in here today. Yeah, uh, it was great. We thanks we, for having you me. You were on TV earlier. We were on the local airwaves here in Tampa. Always fun. Always, Always fun. fun. And uh, feel free, folks, of course, to give him a follow on social media and subscribe to the Lawyer You Know YouTube channel. The very latest on WFLA.com, the WFLA app. Thanks so much for joining us here on WFLA Now.